from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sally Sattel. Sally Sattel is a psychiatrist and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. From 1988 to 1993, she was an assistant professor at Yale University where she remains a lecturer. Sattel is the author of many scholarly articles and books, including Drug Treatment, The Case for Coercion, and PCMD, How Political Correctness is Corrupting Medicine. In Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience, published by Basic Books in 2013, she and co-author psychologist Scott O. Lilienfeld reveal how many of the real-world applications of human neuroscience gloss over its limitations and complexities, often obscuring the many factors in psychology that shape our behavior and identities. Sattel and Lilienfeld analyze what brain scans and other neurotechnologies can and cannot tell us about ourselves, and they stress the complex nature of our selfhood, free will, and personal responsibility. Brainwashed was a finalist for the 2013 Los Angeles Times Brook Prize in Science. Please welcome Sally Sattel. Great to see everyone, thank you. And little apologies about this, the uh, slide projector. It's a little small, but most of my slides aren't very busy. So in, in fact, so my first slide is a copy of the um, cover of the book. And to be honest, right after we decided on that, I, I really thought of a better title. <laughs> I wanted, now I want it to be Fifty Shades of Gray Matter. And that's not just a play on the, on this po on the popular novel, but it's, it's ex explicitly meant to evoke the concept of seduction. Um, in this case, the seduction into certain beliefs about behavior that uh, technologies like brain scanning can lead us to. And the epitome of seduction, I would say, in neuroscience is, okay, good, is a, a brain scan, which is now the signature technology of modern neuroscience. In fact, someone said the brain scan has now replaced the, the atom, Bohr's atom, as the, kind of the symbol of, of, of science. But, um, so that's a brain scan, and it's really quite a wondrous thing. The reason why I consider it a perfect storm of seduction is, it, is, is really that so many forces converge on it. First, it's an absolutely dazzling technology. Uh, we're not going to go into that in too much depth. It's very complicated. I have a whole chapter on it in the book. But it's amazing technology, and like all technologies, it promises objectivity and a more scientific gaze. Um, it's about the brain. Neuroscience, of course, is about the brain, which is a masterwork of nature. About 80 billion cells or neurons, each communicating uh, with thousands of others, which is more connections than the Milky Way. This is just some of them. Um, it's the organ of the self, and people tend to think, understandably, that it can reveal all kinds of secrets about human nature. It's visual, and we are highly visual primates, which is not something you can say, for example, about genes. Anyone can see a brain scan. It's much harder to see nucleic acid. And and lastly, there's an element, it's almost an element of surprise that accompanies brain scans. Um, people tend to think, uh, especially people who are, you know, not steeped in science, not particularly sophisticated in that realm, and, you know, why should they be the, actual, the average person reading the Science Times? Like, oh, my gosh, look, it's in the brain. It's in the brain. That's a very key phrase. Well, of course it's in the brain. Um, all thoughts and emotions are in the brain. Where else would the biological correlates of, of behavior, emotion, and thinking be? They're not in the pancreas, they're in the brain. Um, and you see headlines, of course, you've seen them. Uh, political bias affects brain activity accompanied by a brain scan. Math anxiety is in the brain. Well, of course it's in the brain. Um, and as a psychiatrist, these, these kinds of uh, headlines really annoy me. Um, proof that depression is real. B 
because we have a brain scan to show that, or anorexia, or PTSD, that now we know the suffering is real. Well, we knew it before. We didn't need a brain scan to tell us that. We need a brain scan to tell us some things. Right now, it's mainly in the realm of research. There aren't that many clinical applications, but a few, but in the realm of research, and, and very good research, but like so much, of research, when it filters through the press and into the popular media, things get distorted. The phrase in the brain is seductive in another way, because it kind of carries an exculpatory whiff, the don't blame me, don't blame my brain, and also the notion that if, if X lights up, you hear the phrase lights up, uh, which real, all that means is that there's increased activity in a particular area of the brain. There's always activity in the brain. If there's not, you're, you're dead. Anyway, if X lights up, then Y behavior inevitably happens. And that is not the case either. And we'll be talking a lot about that. But you could see why that sort of conceit, the X lighting up and Y then inevitably following, it would be so appealing to, to trial lawyers. And indeed, now there's a whole new a whole new field called neuro law, which is uh, uh, looking, at, um, looking at the implications of, of brain science for understanding the criminal mind. But it's a really nice story that criminal, uh, d that defense attorneys can tell. You know, see, Your Honor, my client has this in, in his brain. He could not control himself. He could not form the intent needed to commit a crime. This is a misreading of neuroimaging. Sometimes, without question, people do have problems with their brains that render them legally insane so that they are not, they are not culpable. Uh, all kinds of damages, uh, damage can happen to one's uh, cognitive apparatus, rendering people either not culpable at all or, they, or the less culpable, let's say, so that they're not excused, but their sentence is mitigated. That happens clearly, but the point is that at this point in time, and things might change as the technology evolves, but at this point in time, we cannot distinguish who those people are through brain scans. We can't distinguish an impulse that is irresistible from one that was not resisted. This is a key point I want to return to as well. And finally, another misconception of popular readings of brain scans is the notion that you can actually pinpoint emotions or complex or subtle emotions or complex feelings. That's just simply not true. And in fact, um, that, that kind of uh, activity uh, has led to the phrase, uh, some to accuse, uh, oversimplification of the reading of, of brain images as being akin to neophrenology, but that's original phrenology, but neophrenology, as if the brain is, is highly modular and specific areas of it are involved solely with, with certain kinds of, kinds of reactions. Now, clearly, certain parts of the brain are more um, involved more heavily in mediating certain kinds of reactions. We know about the amygdala, for example, that's, that's famously uh, invoked when we talk about fear reactions, but that particular part of the brain also happens to figure very prominently in processing no uh, perceptions of novelty or surprise. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. In fact, circuitry is really where it is, and all neuroscientists, of course, know this. And, and, and I, I mean, again, a lot of the problem here is how this is how uh, popular neuroscience has been has come through the media. There are some wonderful science journalists who know their background and they're very careful, and others a little less so. And then there's a whole crop of people called neuro and <laughs> um, neuro entrepreneurs who are trying to make a frankly trying to make a buck <laughs> off selling things that have to do with education and neuroscience and a lot of fads that one has to be very careful about. Um, so really, circuitry is where it is, and that's where neuroscientists are focusing most, <clears throat> most of their energy, how the various regions interact with each other. It's enormously complicated. 
And that's why I said fMRI is still basically a research tool. Um, we're probably one foot into a 10-mile long journey on understanding the, the brain. But nonetheless, these brain images have migrated into the public sphere where, with the implied promise of decoding the brain, one can see why politicians are so interested. In fact, there are some, some uh, uh, public relations groups that offer neuroimaging uh, in an attempt to advise their clients about how to make their candidates more appealing. This was actually from an op-ed in the New York Times from 2007 where candidates were uh, shown to, to swing voters and the reactions of those voters' brains were uh, supposedly indicative of what the candidate would have to do to appeal to them more. I mean, this is neuroscience at its most popular and sort of dumbed down. Um, marketers are very interested. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is a book, by, very clever title, by a famous neuromarketer uh, trying to tap into the brain through brain scans or EEG or other kinds of technologies that will reveal uh, <clears throat> brain-based data. To tap into the brain to learn what consumers want, kind of like cutting out the middleman, which is you, and going straight to your brain. Um, certainly, We'd love to find out, uh, find a good, a good lie detector. And this is, we have a whole chapter on this as well. And frankly, this is one of the few where there's some proof of concept, that there are neural signatures that can distinguish between truth telling and lying. But it would be almost impossible at this time to apply it in the real world. In a laboratory setting with lots of controls, it, it has some fairly good um, validity. <coughs> Then there's the question of uh, how we gauge the pull of temptations from Oreos to, to cocaine. And then defense attorneys, as I mentioned before, trying to prove that their clients lack malign intent or even free will. And I, I would offer a book to anyone who knows who these two guys are. I think I heard Leopold and Loeb. I think someone said that. OK, I may owe you a book. Um, okay, so we, as I said, we devote a chapter to neuromarketing and the lie detection and, um, uh, and, and neuro law. And, uh, and we try to tease apart the hype from what seems promising, from what are just technical obstacles in achieving the, an ultimate goal of being able to infer something about the mind from the brain, and what are conceptual barriers to doing that, and what's just flat out pseudo neuroscience. So with that as background, I want to focus on the part of the book that to, uh, to me, and uh, I don't know if I speak for my co-author, Scott Lilienfeld, but um, <clears throat> to me, this is one of the most interesting things, which is um, the culturally significant implications of our growing ability to explain behavior in neurological terms. In other words, the better we get at, be, at describing human behavior through biology, and we're only going to get better at it, how is that going to affect the way we think about human freedom, the freedom to choose our actions? And I'm going to explore this uh, through addiction. Uh, I actually am an addiction psychiatrist. That's, that's my area of, of specialty. So, so I can say with... Uh, complete honesty that for, gosh, at least 20 years, 20 years, yeah, I've been, um, I've been very, very interested in the way addiction is, is uh, conceptualized and portrayed to the public. And frankly, this is the way <clears throat> it's talked about now, <clears throat> excuse me, in the media, educational campaigns, <clears throat> pardon me, Water that's over there. Um, but this is this. This is your brain literally on cocaine. It's a new frying pan ad. Thanks. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And actually, this represents a very legitimate and very um, an, uh, interesting experiment. Not not interesting in terms of its results. You'd expect the results, but the fact that we can can visualize the results is pretty darn amazing. Basically. Um, 
this study has two general paradigms. One, you uh, take someone who is a co has a cocaine problem and you expose them in, in a brain scanner. This happens to be a PET scan, but it's the same general notion. This one uses metabolic activity and fMRI or, or brain scan will, uses blood flow. But they both, they, both, uh, they both reflect increased enhanced activity in the brain. It's, <clears throat> pardon me. So you take someone who has a cocaine problem, you put them in a, in a scanning apparatus, and you show them uh, films. There's little mirrors in these machines, and the person looks up, and they can see a film of um, people using cocaine, of cocaine paraphernalia, um, and they experience a subjective desire to use cocaine, and their brain will reflect in what we call the reward area, a uh, special activation, and that is effectively the neural correlate of their desire to use cocaine. When you show that same person a picture of the, a, a beach or a meadow or something neutral, you don't elicit the same kind of metabolic activity, in this case, mainly dopaminergic ac activity. The other version of it is you have two people, one is a cocaine user and one's not, you show the, but you show them both the films of people using, and you get this reaction in the person who um, has a cocaine history, but none in the person who's never used cocaine, as you might expect. Anyway, it's very neat. It's, it's, it's been replicated a lot. It's great. Um, but the way it's described is that this is the brain being hijacked by cocaine, specifically the referring to hijacking of the, the limbic system, which is a uh, complex and, and fairly uh, uh, old um, brain uh, circuitry. Uh, it contains regions you may have heard of, uh, uh, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the, um, uh, and others. And it mediates reward and memory and emotion. But the language is that it hijacks the brain, that cocaine hijacks this limbic system. And of course the implication, sometimes left as an implication, and sometimes stated outright, is that when someone's brain looks like this effectively, they've, they're out of control. They can, no longer, they can no longer have any control over their actions, and their drug use is involuntary. And the existence of these changes has led many experts now to call addiction a brain disease. A brain disease because there are brain changes in the context of addiction. Well, that is true. There are brain changes in the context of addiction. But still, the label brain disease deserves a lot of scrutiny. First, changes in the brain are not a signifier of pathology. Learning Italian changes the brain. As you know, there's much plasticity that's involved with learning. Alzheimer's changes the brain. But addiction is not like learning Italian. Your language lessons don't take on the quality of a compulsion like a crack habit. Nor is it like Alzheimer's, with its own inexorable progression to dementia that is completely beyond the control of the sufferer. The brain changes of Alzheimer's disease render the patient completely resistant to any rewards or sanctions. If you said to your grandmother, Grandma, I'm going to give you a million dollars if your memory doesn't deteriorate. Or, Grandma, I'm going to shoot you if your memory deteriorates. It won't matter. But the brain changes of addiction, thank goodness, do not impair the capacity to be deterred. Now, I realize that might sound, especially for people who've known addicts, that might sound a little strange. Or it might sound not strange at all, because uh, people who, who live with people who use drugs can see the decisions they're making every day that uh, uh, make them more or less vulnerable. But in any case, just going into the lab, we know that rewards and sanctions can and do modify the course of behavior, which in some sense is the essence of voluntariness, if a behavior can be modified by its consequences. But let me, uh, that sounds a little too theoretical, so let me give you a great example. These are Vietnam vets. 
And in June of 1971, President Nixon became panicked that there would be a flood of veterans, of, um, yeah, veterans from Southeast Asia coming back to the inner city and further inflame the heroin epidemics in big cities that were already underway. And he was afraid of this because of, uh, it was true that at least half of all GIs had tried um, uh, opium and heroin in Vietnam, where it was very, very abundant. Uh, and about 15 to 20 percent may have actually been addicted. So he was very concerned. So, so they instituted a program called Operation Golden Flow, where everyone had a pee in a cup, and if it wasn't, if it was positive, you weren't leaving Vietnam. And um, to make a long story short, almost everyone passed the test. Everyone who was using and addicted to heroin passed that test. The few who didn't were given an extra week to clean up, then they came back to, to the United States. Then a researcher at the University of Washington named Lee Robbins followed these people for three years and was expecting to see high rates of re-addiction. You know, once they were back home, they would resume their habits. But only about 12% had even had, <clears throat> had used in the three years that they had come back. And that was very, very, very surprising, but also very encouraging. And frankly, it's what it really lies at the heart of recovery and reasonable public policy for addiction, which is the um, intelligent use of uh, sanctions and rewards, which we can make very good use of in the criminal justice system. It's a different issue about legalizing. I'm not going to, of course, get into legalization or anything like that. Taking the system as we find it, to the extent that we can divert people from incarceration because of nonviolent drug crimes and put them in drug courts. We've been doing that for years. And these courts are based on the principles of, of behavior, which is that swift, certain, but not severe sanctions um, can really shape behavior. And drug courts have been going on for quite a while and, and are uh, quite successful. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, there are many others in the book. But the point is that if you just focused at the level of the brain, <clears throat> if you just talked about <clears throat> the nucleus accumbens and the hippocampus, I apologize, <clears throat> <clears throat> you would not think about shaping behavior. When you're told something's a brain disease, you think it's involuntary. How do, how do uh, drug addicts, how do I work with my patients to, so they don't crave? Well, we, we come up with strategies to allow them to what's called self-binding, ways to basically put barriers between themselves and their drugs. You've probably heard the common ones, stay away from people, places, and things. Um, oh, thanks so much. <clears throat> Deposit your paycheck, don't have money available. I had a patient, I had a patient who used to um, shoot up, so he, um, and every time he looked at his arms, where of course he had tracks, it would, it would stimulate a sense of craving. So he had to wear long sleeve shirts all the time or he would find himself too, too aroused. Um, avoid boredom, avoid, th this is the kind of thing people have to do. The point is, this involves motivation, this involves conscious engagement. Again, if we focus too much at the level of the brain, we're not going to pay attention to these things. And that's what I'm describing as a kind of Ulysses phenomenon where patients, <clears throat> where patients sort of bind themselves, not to the mast in this case, but um, create barriers to, to, to their use, to recognize situations of vulnerability like hearing siren, the siren song of cocaine, but restraining yourself in some way. Okay, so addiction is a good example, and this discussion that's this far is a good example of what um, Scott and I call uh, neurocentrism. And that's one of the problems, we think, with the way neuroscience has been popularized. Neurocentrism is the idea that human behavior can be best explained by looking solely or primarily at the brain. 
that somehow that level of analysis gives you the most authentic, true, reliable understanding of a behavior. Probably true if you have Alzheimer's disease. Addiction, no. Post-traumatic stress disorder, no. Depression, no. Uh, the problems with a neurocentric view is that you'll emphasize medication too much. I'm not against medication. I work in a methadone clinic. But to think that methadone is the answer in and of itself is clearly not true. You're going to downplay the importance of psychology and behavior. And we can't afford to lose the, lose the mind in the age of brain science. When I refer to mind, I'm talking broadly about feelings, thoughts, desires, intentions, memories, subjectivity. Um, I don't want you to think for a minute we're falling into any kind of dualism trap. This is Descartes. Uh, the mind is wholly dependent upon the brain, no questions there. All subjective experience is, in the, uh, is, is mediated through the brain. No brain, no consciousness. But it's very important to realize that the, um, the physical rules from one level of analysis, and I'm going to skip to my level of analysis. <clears throat> I apologize that you probably can't see that very well. But basically, that's just breaking all the levels of analysis down, starting from the environment and ending up at, I guess that ends up at genes. It could end up at quantum physics, but um, that is, we can't yet use the physical rules from the cellular level to predict activity at the psychological level. If you want to understand, if you're reading a book and you want to understand what the text means, for example, you don't subject the ink to a chemical analysis. That's not the level that's going to inform you about the meaning of the book. These are just different levels of analysis, and the important thing is that some questions are answered better at one or more of these levels. Others are answered best at, at others. They're not right or wrong. Is addiction, does addiction affect the brain? Of course it does. But if we stay at that level, we're going to miss a lot. Um, OK. So it's not just addiction, um, but biological explanations of complex behavior can mislead in the courtroom as well. And trial lawyers love that, and they're counting on jurors <laughs> to get seduced as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, again, there are certainly cases where people's brains are defective and they cannot be held legally accountable. It's just that brain images are not helpful in distinguishing who they are. And I have to say yet, maybe that will change at some point. But it can be highly misleading. And <clears throat> biological explanations in general influence the way we think about responsibility over action. There have been uh, many interesting studies explaining um, behavior, explaining behavior in biological terms and uh, compared to psychological terms. For example, my brain may be doing it, or, or describing, some, that's, I'm being flipped, it, just describing some, some sort of neural correlate of uh, behavior or genetic explanation. And people are much more likely to attribute less blame to the person if they had committed a crime, and this is a, an explanation given for their behavior. The impulse to punish is a lot less severe um, when people understand it as being uh, a, a behavior that flowed from, was caused by a brain problem as opposed to a childhood problem. But this can also backfire as uh, when people accept a biological explanation for mental illness and substance abuse, the desire for social distance and the stigma enhances and uh, they have less faith that treatment, that therapy will work, and they believe that individuals are more dangerous. Um, so this is important to know. It's important to know that the implications of how we describe behavior, it doesn't, it, it's not, I'm not telling you how you should describe behavior. You don't want to manipulate explanations so as to, uh, elicit uh, specific kinds of, of reactions. If the problem is in the brain, for example, uh, you have to be truthful and talk about that. Um, but it's, it's interesting 
how these explanations do uh, affect our fundamental intuitions of, uh, of, of human agency. And, and it, my point is simply that they can be manipulated. Um, so, now let's go a little bit deeper in 15 more minutes. Um, I, I'll leave a little time for, for discussion, but I want to go a little deeper. Um, well, now, when lawyers use brain scans in capital cases, which is now pretty much de rigueur, they're making the point that their client couldn't form an intent, or their client couldn't reason properly. Their client had some sort of poor control. But the implication is that the default circumstance is that, well, most people can control themselves. Most people do know what they're doing. Most people can be deterred, um, but not my client. But some uh, neuroscientists and some philosophers should, are taking, going a step further, and they're arguing that no one has the capacity for choice, that none of us could act other than we did, and that all of us, not just criminals, are not in control of our actions at any point. Wow. Um, now, you will recognize this, of course, as the fiendish ancient debate about free will, um, which we're not going to resolve here, <laughs> so you know. Now, many neuroscientists claim we don't have free will, and that, and, and this is not new, this debate's been going on for centuries, but they do argue that neuroscience will make this clear, that basically neuroscience will finally resolve the free will debate. That debate, um, well, that, that neuroscience will finally clear up the free will debate. Now, this brings us to another very interesting aspect here, the implications of brain science for morality more generally, not just whether an individual could or could not control himself or, or should be responsible, uh, but whether the concept of responsibility at all is a coherent one. And this gets us back to okay, our boys. Now, in 1924, I think everyone probably knows this story, in Hyde Park, Chicago, these two brilliant kids wanted to commit the perfect crime. So they found a 14-year-old boy and um, killed him and drove him to Indiana, put his body in a drain pipe, went home, played cards, called the families, uh, the family of the child and said they needed the ransom and were very pleased with themselves and thought that, that they had gotten away with it. Well, they didn't. Three days later, apparently one of them dropped their glasses and they traced it to, to Leopold and Loeb. And uh, their families hired the famous, attor um, famous attorney, Clarence Darrow, who the next year went on to, I believe, do inherit the inherit the wind. Um, so it was a month-long trial, in fact, literally 90 years ago, right, this, today. And uh, at the end of it, there was a 12-hour summation by um, Clarence Darrow. He, he basically want, was arguing for life in prison as opposed to hanging. He did succeed, although the judge said it had to do with their youth, not his argument. And Darrow's argument was right out of the uh, what you might call the determinist's playbook. In other words, well, I'll, I'll tell you what he said. Why did they kill little Bobby Franks? Not for money, not for spite, not for hate. They killed him because they were made that way. They were nature's victims. And he said, and this is sort of the essence of, you, I'm sure you remember this from Philosophy 101, but the, the notion of uh, determinism, which is that each act we perform, criminal or otherwise, follows from a cause. And given the same conditions, the same result will flow every time. Again, um, we're talking, for example, the, all the causes that go into a person, the genes, the, your experiential history, your environment, um, your genetic history, and, uh, and all these in the context you're in at the moment, the idea is that all these impinge on an individual so that at the moment of having to make a decision, 
there's basically, you're kind of fated to make one choice. There's no real choice. It, it, whether you're gonna choose soup over salad or murder over mercy, there was really no choice to be made because up until that moment of decision, you couldn't have chosen otherwise based on this whole history of uh, this whole causal parade. Now, again, I'm assuming that that sounds familiar. Um, remember, in, the, in this view, there's no praise, there's no blame, right? Because you were just, you couldn't have done otherwise. You just acted based on all the forces impinging on you. Now, certainly that's not an intuitive view of how we act. Um, on the other hand, it is true that much of our behavior is caused, and much of it's caused even in, for, in unconscious ways. That's, that's true. But how is neuroscience, and I compare it here, I think that's the line with two quotations, but the bottom one where it says, we're victims of neuronal circumstances, the top one is Clarence Darrow. The bottom is a neuroscientist. That we're all victims of neuronal circumstances. Well, if that's true, then what happens? Um, well, this goes away. There's no blame. It means we have to change our criminal justice system radically. Turn it into one that is highly utilitarian, where we might pe put people in jail, but it's to deter them from acting again and deter others who would observe how we've punished them, to contain dangerous people, and to rehabilitate them, but no punishment. Now, this is, as I said, these debates have been going on for, for a long time, and they, now with the addition of neuroscience, they add, they lead up to this question. Oh, maybe you can't read it. It says, is there a way to preserve moral responsibility in a world in which all events leading up to the moment of choice determine what that choice will be? And the better we get at understanding the neural pathways, we'll actually see that process. Well, I don't know, this is what happens to me when I think about it. It's, it's a tough one, and it ends in tears. And, I, and I'm not, we're not resolving it, but the point is that neuroscience is not resolving it either. And the way philosophers have largely dealt with it and is to just think about the kinds, of, the kinds of freedom that are necessary to make a choice. If the kind of freedom you think is necessary is the kind that is completely uncaused, where people essentially operate in a vacuum, which is hard to imagine how that could happen. I mean, all your behaviors are caused. There's reasons. Some you're aware of, some you're not so aware of. But Unless we live in a causal vacuum, then there's no such thing as ultimate free will. Well, okay, those people are called hard determinists, and they do go towards the utilitarian view of, of uh, the criminal justice system. Or then you have people, and I'm a little bit more sympathetic to this, the compatibilist view, which basically says that as long as people <clears throat> can, can reason, can deliberate, can plan, can change their minds, that that's enough freedom for people to be considered to have free will. If there's something wrong with your brain so that you can't reason or deliberate or respond to deterrence or res respond to reason, then uh, maybe you as an individual have, do have your freedom compromised and maybe you should be excused. But as, as a species, we do have free will. I don't know how you come down on that, but neuroscience is not going to help you resolve it. So I should end there. I see that I have only five more minutes. I, of course, I do have more to say. Um, the book is basically a culture book. I consider it much more of a culture book than a science book. Um, I think it's you know, inevitable that uh, as biological manifestations and, and explanations and mechanisms are understood, they're going to have enormous therapeutic benefit. We didn't even talk about the benefits, and I know there's a talk later t today in this room about neuroscience, and I assume that's, he'll talk a lot about that as well. Um, and it will have, it is the final scientific frontier. Um, that's all very true. Uh, but we shouldn't get seduced into thinking too mechanically about ourselves and too reductively about human nature, simply because we're learning more and more about how we function. Thank you so much. So
I guess there might be time for two questions, if anyone. Or one. I can't. Is there a. Oh, I'm no, sorry. Oh, I, can, I don't think your thing was on, but the question was, um, does AA work? And the short answer is, AA works for whom it works. I don't mean to be flip, but some people, it saves some people's lives. Um, the, it, you know, most treatments don't have the greatest rates. AA doesn't either. Uh, so it's at an individual level, yes, it can be life-saving. Uh, but uh, the average person won't stop drinking right away. Um, but there are there, the, the kinds of, uh, of treatments that work the best are ones we don't use. We don't use these contingency, these, these rewards and sanctions very much, which is a shame, we, unless you're a doctor or a pilot. And then if you lose your license, we have all kinds of built-in contingencies for you, like you've got something to lose and you're going to lose it unless you shape up. And the rates of recovery in professionals are 95% because there's so, there's so much, A, because there's so much to lose, B, these are obviously people with skills as well. Um, but, I mean, you're dealing with a different kind of population, but they don't do as, they've, they do much better, the professionals do much better um, in terms of recovery when there are contingencies uh, attached to them as well. Yes? Hi, could you? Oh. Exactly. Could you talk a little bit, please, about food addiction? Because you said that you're from Yale, and well, you know, kind of playing a little bit off of the AA yeah. model. But um, being that Yale also has the, the food addiction scale, and that is a marriage of a survey of behavior with neuroscience and the brain scans and so forth. But that uh -huh. is poised to really impact legislation and the prepared food industry. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd written, actually, that picture comes from an article I wrote about that last, last year. There was a um, a, a, a research um, study that got an inordinate amount of attention and a really bad quality work, but it compared rat with rats. Um, rats are fine, but there's just so much you can extrapolate to humans. But um, anyway, that cocaine was as, that Oreos were as addictive as cocaine. Don't know if you recall that. Um, and the idea was that because uh, they made this, they concluded this because you see some of the same neural signatures, and this is true in humans as well. Um, uh, the, the reward pathway that I mentioned is, of course, elicited by food, and, you know, and sex, and anything pleasurable, and uh, and cocaine. And it's very facile, I think, to uh, say that uh, food addiction is like cocaine. What it shows us is that people have a desire for it. There's anticipation and then there's a desire. In fact, it may register anticipation more than it does actual desire. Um, and the same principles apply uh, as they do to, um, to addiction in the sense that, or to any behavior that, that's habitual, <clears throat> to the extent that uh, we can learn the cues that make us more or less vulnerable uh, and with motivation and other kinds of, of techniques uh, we can overcome them. It's really, it's, I'm not gonna, I certainly am not arguing that the same, some of the same neural uh, mechanisms are engaged. Uh, what, I, what I would argue against though is that the person is then rendered helpless. And, and I do think that you're exactly right, there have been a lot of product liability uh, uh, efforts to um, sue uh, big food. Uh, and uh, that this is potentially a new uh, a trial lawyer's dream to make it as analogous to addiction as possible. And I think that's, that would be a real abuse of neuroscience. Um, I guess one more. Uh, I'm just a little confused. I'm addicted to ice cream. Uh -huh. Okay, now, is this, if it's not in my brain, where is that addiction located? Or am I just a little fat piggy? Oh, no, no, that's, what, that's one of the first things we I said is, of course it would be in the brain. That's, um, that's exactly where it is. And that's where, that's where everything is. It's almost trivially true to say something is in the brain. And there are things in the brain we haven't found. If you um, recall uh, this um, awful crime in 2001 of uh, Andrea Yates, this poor woman who had postpartum psychosis and drowned her kids, um, there was no brain scan in her trial. There was none. 
But even if they attempted to bring one in now, it probably wouldn't reveal much. We can't even make the most, the most significant psychiatric diagnoses, like postpartum psychosis, bipolar, schizophrenia. We can't make those diagnoses with great certainty based on brain scans. And that's, we will, I'm sure we will one day, or with other information. Uh, obviously, genetics, uh, genetic information is now is all so difficult. There are so many genes, 100 genes involved with schizophrenia, perhaps. So it's very complicated. We'll get there, I do think, but we're not there yet. So um, again, it's a, lim it's a limited technology, and, and responsible neuroscientists know that, and they, they really cringe when they see it being applied so sloppily in the public realm. But um, they cringe, but, I wrote, but we wrote the book. So. I guess I should end now, should I? Oh, okay, one more. Um, do you believe that there's a um, like pre-genetic disposition that people are born with like to have addictions? Like if you, for example, if you were um, an alcoholic, but then you're recovering from that, you're automatically going to then be addicted to something else just because there's... Right. Well, well I certainly, there is no question there are uh, genetic predispositions to these things. Uh, genetic predisposition can be anything from how pleasurable, I mean, how pleasurable we find a, a certain, uh, uh, let's say alcohol, varies a lot. I mean, some people just find it disgusting. Some people can't even metabolize. This is typical of certain Asian populations where they can't metabolize alcohol very well. There's not going to be a lot of alcoholism there simply because they can't. Um, but these are probabilistic. Remember, if your parents are alcoholics, you know, some people say, just don't even try it. Just why even, you know, put yourself in that position? But it's not like your mother has Huntington's, heaven forbid, and you have that gene. It's not that kind of simple um, uh, genetic transmission at all. We're talking probability, and in this case, you can, as I said, address it in the most simple way, which is just not even go near it at all, or uh, pace yourself. There are all kinds of, of, of strategies a person can use so that if they do feel things are getting out of control, they can pull back. And I must tell you that most people pull back. Uh, clinicians tend to see people who have trouble. In fact, there's something called the clinician's illusion, which is a problem, and I'm sure I've engaged in it myself as well, where we extrapolate too vigorously from the people we see in a clinic to the people in, out in the general universe. Uh, we saw this after 9-11. There was an assumption that the, the New York City would be traumatized. The amount of money that went into mental health services was astounding and all well-meaning, clearly. And it turned out that, look, if you were in the tower, of course, you could have had a severe psychiatric reaction. If you knew someone who died, you were vulnerable. But the vast majority of people were upset as hell, but not pathological at all. People are resilient, but we're not, that's not the people psychiatrists see. We see the people who have trouble coping. And uh, so it's too, it's too, we see addicts, for example, who don't recover on their own. So many do, but that's not who we see and that's not who we research. Um, that's not to say you don't come in for treatment if you're having trouble, you come in right away and don't, don't you wait for it to play out because you could get AIDS, all kinds of things could happen. But the natural history is for people to recover on their own. So on that optimistic note, I will stop. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.